Next. We are live. It's setting up the meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, shall we go? Shall, shall I start? Yes. Wait just a minute. I yes. click on the recording. Yes, yes. It's live okay. now. It's live now. I already am ready recording, Safi. Okay, okay, okay. Good. You can go on, Yuri. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're alive. I think we're recording, hopefully. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to... <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to a, another edition of uh, One Plus One, your place for inconvenient truth telling and myth busting. Although this is a very special edition because uh, because this is actually a crossover episode. So this is not just One Plus One. This is One Plus One working with Orinoco uh, Tribune, and this is our and uh, yeah. So so we're going to be talking all things Latin America. We're going to be talking about the recent summits in the Americas, the recent elections that happened in uh, Colombia. And of course, what that means for Chile, uh, for uh, for uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and uh, Cuba. So, uh, so, uh, so we are joined by by uh, the editor and founder in chief of Orinoco Tribune, Jesus Rodriguez Espinoza, and we are joined by uh, frequent uh, editor of uh, and, and contributor to Orinoco Tribune, Sahili Chaldhuri. And we also, that's that's not just it, we're also joined by Arnold August. Arnold August is the Montreal-based uh, journalist, historian, and activist uh, um, who, who you all should know. He's He's been on my program. He's been on Orinoco uh, Tribune. He's also, and he's a frequent contributor to uh, to the Canada Files, where he is associate editor, and he's a frequent guest on Press TV, Telesaur English, uh, RT, and the author of three brilliant books, Democracy in Cuba, the 1997-98 Elections, uh, Cuba and Its Neighbors, Democracy in Motion, which I'm currently uh, reading, and uh, his latest, Cuba-U.S. Relations, Obama and Beyond. Uh, so first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, uh, for joining me today, and thank you to our audience for, uh, for, for watching us today. And uh, Thank you for inviting us. oh, it's a real honor to have uh, to have you on. And uh, all right, let's uh, you know let's let's get straight into it. So my first question I'd like to ask uh, I'd like to ask Arnold first, followed uh, followed by you, Jesus and Sahili, is your overall impressions on the summit of Americas, which uh, I believe it was a spectacular failure. For the U.S. and Canadian Empire, so uh, so yeah, uh, which moments uh, you know were your highlights, and and, and talk and, and talk just in general about your overall impressions of what went down in uh, Los Angeles. So you want to start Star with me, uh, starting with you, Arnold, followed by uh, Jesus and Sahili. Yeah. Well, first I have to say uh, I'm not too sure if uh, one should call it a spectacular failure, because I, in my view, like how do was how does one assess an event like the Summit of the Americas? Firstly, based on my own uh, type of research that I do, I look not at what the bourgeois press says about the event. I look at what was actually said by those individuals in the event, whether it's Biden or the Mexican foreign secretary or Trudeau or you name it. Secondly, I think it's important in order to evaluate a, an event, one has to look at what happened after the event. Everyone went home. Was there a major change, a shift in U.S.-Canadian policy uh, with regards to Latin America? Or did it remain the same or did it get worse? So based on that, that is my orientation, I would say that it was not a, a, a spectacular flop nor was it a great success for Biden. It was something in between. Allow me to explain. When uh, we read uh, that, uh, this is, came out by uh, Bruno Rodriguez, the Cuban foreign minister, uh, let the international public know that the Biden was working behind the scenes to exclude Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua from the event. Now, when I first read this, as a Canadian, I'm not a Venezuelan, are you? as a Canadian, which is part of this whole oppressive apparatus of the summit organized, in fact, by the OAS, my immediate gut reaction was, well, we should, all the countries should 
should boycott it. I mean, how can that be accepted that these three countries are not invited, excluded? And, you know, I was so I was very happy to read a, a very good uh, article in a Black Agenda Report. I'm a very close follower of Black Agenda Report and Black Alliance for Peace. And they put the words into my mouth when they said it should be boycotted, you know. And, and uh, you know, in my recent article that I wrote in the course of the uh, preparation by Trudeau and others for that uh, uh, summit, I finished by saying, well, the way it's going, it, the boycott might not happen, but in retrospect, several months or years from now, it, one may conclude that the only right position, correct position, would, be, would have been to boycott it. So if, can I just expand you know, uh, one or two examples for example, during mm -hmm. the summit, you know, to show that it was not a spectacular flop and why? Firstly, the uh, Mexican, uh, what I, like, first I'd like to say, in my view, the most courageous stand amongst the countries among them was Bruno Rodriguez of, of Cuba. He was interviewed, not many people know this because it was only in Spanish. He was interviewed right after the summer, summit. And he let the public know for the first time when Cuba was excluded, the president of Cuba, President Miguel Diaz Canel, he said, no way, I'm not going as president. Then we find out from Bruno that the Biden tried to negotiate with Cuba in the back channel to have a lower level de delegation coming from Cuba, for example, the foreign minister or whatever. And Bruno Rodriguez <laughs> said, no, we are not accepting it either. We are completely boycotting it. That was a principal stand. And, and uh, Venezuela, and of course, Nicara Nicaragua had uh, similar positions. Now, I'd just like to give you one example before I, I uh, allow others to, to develop their own previous, uh, or their own experiences. Now, uh, much was said that the president of Mexico took a very courageous stand. He said, I'm not going. And he explained mm -hmm. why. This is his tradition over the last few months since he was elected, that he's going to send his foreign minister, very good. But, you know, and, 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 and carefully looking at all the documents that were produced at the summit, I find, found a, a statement or a, a transcript of, a, uh, of a, um, a discussion, a meeting between the uh, Venezuelan uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, Ebrard, with Biden. And you know what he told Biden? Uh, well, he congratulated Biden for the summit, saying it was very very well organized. So I thought, you know, I guess that is pretty diplomatic. It's nice. But at the same time, what message does this give to Mexico and indirectly to, uh, to, to the United States and other countries? Well, it was, you know, a lot of countries didn't attend. But, you know, any case, it was very well organized. So this raised some doubts. I could give other examples later on, but I'd like to have the input of, of, of the other two panels uh, on, on in response to your question. Okay, uh, Sah uh, Saheli, uh, uh, yeah, your response to the uh, summit. So, uh, what, what was a spectacular failure or, uh, or, or a bit of a mixed bag, but there were some good uh, moments of poking at the eye of the uh, Anglo-Canadian uh, US empire. Okay, so uh, firstly, yeah, if, if we knew that all, all the 30, well, all the countries apart from US and uh, Canada would not be boycotting it because there was, let's remember, there was a tremendous pressure on all countries and there is all the time a tremendous pressure on, on all the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean coming from the US. And it's because these places have been literally and figuratively colonized for 200 years. Like they have not had any independence. Their first independence was not really independence because uh, the, it, immediately afterwards, the US started different kinds of colonialism, including stealing territory. It stole half of Mexico and it uh, stole the islands from this country and that country, or it did like, it started all this problem with the Esequibo region of uh, between Venezuela and Guyana and all these things. So these places have been for long, like for, at least until the latter half of the 20th century, these places had been all colonies. Okay, so 
when uh, the foreign affairs minister, the, sorry, when the president of Mexico, he was actually, I mean, I mean just after Cuba, when the news broke that it, the US, especially Biden or the State Department, whatever, whoever was the real organizer, let's say that OAS is actually the Ministry of Colonies of the US. It's not really an independent body or anything. Yeah, so, exactly. So when uh, the Biden administration decided to, news broke that the Biden administration has decided to exclude these three countries, considering them not democracies. Well, the US can give a rubber stamp on democracy. So yeah, so it was uh, like Arnold mentioned, the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, was the first person to say that he is not going and he will send a lower level delegation. Nobody really boycotted, but sent lower level delegations, most countries. Okay. So, but I mean, those who boycotted sent lower level delegations or things like that. But he was the first one who said, and uh, I will I'll come to Marcelo Everard's position later because there is actually some internal contradictions within the government of Mexico also, like there are contradictions everywhere. Anyway, so after that, there was Luis Arce, there was, was a, before Luis Arce actually, there was the CARICOM, the Caribbean community, and the Caribbean community, uh, uh, ambassador of the Caribbean community, said that or the president of the Caribbean community said that uh, the Caribbean community would boycott or most countries of the CARICOM would boycott if uh, Cuba and Venezuela especially were excluded because both these countries had helped this Caribbean region, especially the islands a lot. And not just with health, Venezuela had this Petro Caribe, which, were, which has been like derailed, decimated thanks to the sanctions, but uh, uh, people in these regions remember, right? Even if the government would like to forget. Anyway, so that's what they said. And there, then there was a Ralph Gonsalves, we should mention him too, the prime minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He said that he is not going. And he said at the Alba TCP summit, which took place the Friday before the summit of the Americas began, and it will take place in Havana, the capital of Cuba. And there he said that he, like, there he mentioned that the US is exerting tremendous pressure on the CARICOM so that they do not boycott. And not only that, that the, all the heads of state were going, not lower level people, but heads of state. And Ralph Gonsalves said that he would not go because that would be against his position. But he also said that he would send a lower level delegation because of two reasons. One was of course the pressure and the other was that it was bad, like it, according to the tradition, his tradition or the tradition of his country, it is bad to spurn any, in, I mean, anyone who invites you, any host. So that is why he will send a lower level delegation. We can understand just from his words, how much pressure under which the CARICOM was. Same happened to all countries. Now, the president of Peru, uh, Pedro Castillo, he, at the, until the last moment, he had not said that he was going. And when he went, he made a mess of everything. Okay, so <laughs> yes, I mean, people like people who had supported him in Peru, they were That's all true. criticizing him after that. Okay, so I read many, many things. Because, from that. Uh, be, 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 because, because the electorate, the left electorate that got him in power w wanted him to boycott the summit. So they had wanted him to not go. They had wanted him yeah. to say, what, and and well, his speech also. That speech was the speech most. Was speech terrible. was the problematic thing. Uh, I'll let Jesus talk about it because he would like to. But anyway, like, okay. it's more like not just left. It's more like the indigenous communities because he comes from them too. So it is more the indigenous communities who are saying that uh, the U.S. actually steals everything from the country, and he went and he kneeled before the empire. Let's uh, say it like that. So these were the problems. Yes, these were problems. And we consider these people left. So Peru, a leftist, he's the leftist president. He was elected from a party that is leftist, that is Marxist-Leninist and also Maria Tegui, because Maria Tegui was the first Marxist-Leninist of that country to I, I mean, theorize uh, a lot of things. We'll not go into theories, but anyway. So he was one. And then there was the president of Chile. I don't call him left, but many people do. 
<laughs> and we are we and we're we're definitely going to talk about Gabriel yes. Boric and Ammo. <laughs> Boric, uh, he went and I, I let Jesus talk about him too because he likes to. <laughs> but anyway, so Boric also went and <laughs> said a lot of bad things about uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua as he usually does. So that was not surprise. That was no surprise. We knew. But before going, his uh, uh, foreign affairs minister and I will. Uh, talk about her later, but the foreign affairs minister, Antonia Urrejola, had said that uh, it's bad that the U.S. is excluding, it should be an inclusive thing, etc., irrespective of what uh, the U.S. thought of the government or not. Okay, But Boric went, and he, he also said terribly bad stuff, and basically aligned with the U.S. He's aligned with the U.S. anyway, but he showed it for everyone. The best thing was Alberto Fernandez, and I will say why. He went and he did us. He gave a speech which uh, became famous. People saw that he is so brave, uh, including Nicolas Maduro said that he is a brave and honest man. He has said this and that. But even before he went, it was first Maduro who said that, well, we will be represented by Alberto Fernandez because he is the president of CELAC, okay, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. So he will be representing us. So our voice will be present, etc. And after that, um, there were like AMLO joined in and said the same thing. There was uh, Miguel Diaz Canel, the president of Cuba, saying the same thing. So it was like a peer pressure on Alberto Fernandez that he had to say this, otherwise, he could not keep his face. So he gave this extraordinarily, extraordinarily brave speech for him. Okay, considering what he is, his speech was quite out of the character. And of course, he has made up to the US with another thing, we'll mention that later again, not in this question, but anyway. So these were like mm, dark and light things of the summit, but what was more important were that there were two counter summits taking place on two sides of the border. One was in Los Angeles, it was the People's Summit for Democracy, is organized by many social movements and as well as leftists from uh, the US, including uh, the principal organizer was People's Forum from New York City. And yeah. he, the um, director of People's Forum, Manolo de los Santos, was mentioned in his speech by uh, Miguel Diaz Canel. He said, like he started his speech with Manolo, right? So that was the person he was mentioning. So he got a mention that mean, meant that it was a recognition from the part of the excluded people and not just, I'm not, when I say excluded, it is not just the three countries that were excluded from the summit. It was also like the people, right? People were excluded, including people in the US. So it was a, this people summit became visible thanks not to CNN or not to NBC or not to Univision, but because of the, all the communicators present like breakthrough news, like uh, uh, this, uh, mm, since Censura, it was from Mexico, there was Alina Duarte there. Um, she did an extraordinary um, streaming every day from the People's Summit. And there were many other communicators from, even from Latin America, from even from Argentina. So everybody spoke, like everybody made this thing visible. So People's Summit became a visible thing. And this counter summit was, I would say, one of the ways that, well, one of the ways in which um, the Summit of the Americas sort of flopped because there was this counter summit that got a lot of visibility. And then in the south of the border in Tijuana, Baja California, that's the Mexico, it's Tijuana is where the US-Mexico border is. It's the, like one of the most militarized borders in the world, maybe the most militarized border in the world. So in Tijuana, there was this Worker Summit of the Americas organized by many organizations from, from Canada to Argentina. Okay, so including the Venezuelan organizations were there and they spoke and it was for three days from 10th of June to 12th of June. And, uh, you know, it's, I would say that it had a history that is, uh, that may be lost, that in Tijuana, for many years, there is this organization from the US called Union del Barrio. It went into Tijuana and it organized with um, trade unions, students unions, teachers unions, uh, peasants unions, etc., from Mexico against the blockade of Cuba. Every year it goes into Tijuana in this time and organizes 
uh, this uh, anti blockage uh, thing. So this time there are three countries blockaded, not one. So it became a bigger event. So these were the two events that made it sort of flop, including Alberto Fernandez. I had to mention him. I'll mention, I'll uh, say other things about him later. But uh, this is my opinion that it was uh, something in between. All righty. Well, then, uh, Arnold, I want your response to this. <clears throat> Uh, give a brief uh, give a brief response to this, and then Jesus can give a brief uh, response to this, and then we'll get to the good stuff about uh, you know bashing uh, Boric and stuff like that. Which is <laughs> so so obviously it sounds to me as if Amlo's boycott was also a bit of a mixed bag because, as Arnold mentioned, uh, he did still send a foreign secretary. Maybe it was a show of diplomacy, but I think yeah, it still would have been much better if he had sent a very great message to the empire and just boycotted it entirely. So was AMLO's uh, boycott of the summit in response to the US barring Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua? But is this a sign that AMLO will lead Mexico down a path of decolonization from the US and Canada? Or, or yeah, well, what, what's your response, Arnold, followed by uh, Jesus? Well, why, that was a very great uh, comment that uh, our comrades said from gave uh, on the whole situation. I would like to say that with regards to um, AMLO, uh, he is still he, one of the most important figures in Latin America to defend Latin America against the United States. And myself and others who favor the boycott, we also recognize in our respective writings that all of the countries in the South are under tremendous pressure by the empire. And even though the yeah. United States is waning, not very many countries in the South are willing to cut ties with the United States at the time. So we have to take this into account. I would like to add one more point that uh, uh, allows me to uh, say with confidence that it was not such a great success was the, um, the, the performance by uh, uh, Mia Motley of the Barbados. She uh, said before going that she is going to go. First of all, I, I really have a lot of respect for Gonzalez and it's not for nothing. His Twitter handle is Comrade Gonzalez, C Comrade Ralph. You can look it up. He had a principal, but he did not go. Wait, uh, who's this? Said, that, 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 who Ralph says that you speak Gonzalez. of? Yeah, Ralph Gonzalez, St. Vicente and Grenadinas. He, his Twitter handle is Comrade Ralph, Ralph and okay. he deserves it because he is steadfast. Now, on the other hand, from that same community, you had the representative of Barbados go there. Now, what did she say? It was a bit sad. By reading it, uh, uh, she said, you know, she calls Bob Marley, okay? And then she goes on to other things, <laughs> saying what? That if Venezuela, Cuba, and uh, Nicaragua, and this is someone who's supposed to have gone there, agreed to go there to call out the United States for exclusion, right? If these three countries are excluded, it's no good because uh, it reinforces their situation. But especially, these, she is lecturing these three countries now that you have to show more respect for human rights, et cetera, and democracy in your respective countries in order to be allowed to participate in the summit of the Americas. What is that? Of course, she was speaking to Secretary of State Blinken. You know, he's a cool guy, woke, right? A woke imperialist. He quoted, <laughs> he mentioned Bob Marley by his first name, Bob, that he also quoted from Bob Marley to show that the, you know, he, as well as the leader of Barbados, they are on the same page with regards to the outlook towards Latin America, especially on the need for uh, countries such as Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Venezuela to advance on the issue of human rights. So that's why I don't feel very bad in saying that one cannot say it was a major flop because they actually got away with it. And of course, you mentioned Bork. That is really important. Like Bork, his before, victory, and actually yeah, and actually, that. before and, and actually before we get to uh, Boric, I you know I uh, you know sorry to interrupt, but I just want to say that also that, that that's also very disappointing that the Prime Minister of Barbados uh, did that, given the fact that she's uh, that she's abolished the Queen of England as the head of uh, state, and uh, you know she's you know you know she's decriminalized marijuana 
has given uh, civil rights to 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 the queer community. So the Maybe fact that the like connection was, with Marley. Yeah, yeah, and and, and the fact so so I the fact that she would say so 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 the fact that she would say something like that about uh, you know she's again it's, it's mixed signals. So on the one hand, she is kind of scolding the U.S. for barring the you know the troika of uh good the axis of good <laughs> nicaragua cuba and venezuela but then she goes and and finds a way to marginalize them but benny who arnold continue with what you were saying so, sorry for interrupting uh, the the boric approach is very important um he is typical of the middle of the rotors i've been studying as you know cuba for about a few decades and i'm really on the case of those uh, cubans in Cuba and outside of Cuba, such as Miami, whose basic position against Biden or Trump, et cetera, is don't lift the blockade. If you don't lift the blockade, it's no good. It will only reinforce Cuba's position of being an authoritarian government to protect themselves against so-called US aggression. Now, Boric took the uh, page out of this game plan from the uh, the supporters of uh, soft regime trades in Cuba and, and said that they should not be included. Why? They, they should not be excluded. Why? It reinforces their authoritarian uh, style of government. So this is, you know, you say it's mixed signal, but the, the important signal there goes to the United States from Boric, as from Barbados, uh, that, you know, you know, it's sure we're, we're against the exclusion, but not to, to that extent that that you that you that you would like we do not fully accept the uh, right the, the position that it was justified to exclude these three countries so you know i'll, I'll leave you know jesus had that great article on boric and our Ar orinoco tribunal let's see what jesus has to say about this and other in, points in, in fact in fact that's a perfect segue to to to, to this question which is you know sadly while while AMLO boycotted, uh, while AMLO boycotted, and President, uh, you know, Fernandez of Argentina did scold uh, the United States, the OAS, the IMF for what they've been doing to Argentina and the uh, region. Uh, yeah, sadly, uh, you, you know, gay, uh, and of course, yeah, uh, you know, you know, Fernandez also defended Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. But as Arnold. Uh, mention as 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 everyone has been mentioning uh gabriel boric the president of uh, chile and uh, colombia the the incoming president of colombia petro continue to uh marginalize venezuela nicaragua and uh yeah venezuela and Nicar uh, nicaragua and cuba oh. and jesus this is something you've been uh monitoring closely as well as your colleagues at Orinoco Tribune, that's Gabriel Boric, again, the center-left, socially liberal, tolerant president of Chile. He continues to punch left and marginalize Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. Uh, what is up with that? Uh, you, you know, you know, uh, you know. What, what is up with that? And the incoming leader Petro of uh, Colombia. Can, you know, can you respond to that? And and uh, and why? Yeah, respond to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, uh, basically, what 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 Arnold and Sahili has been saying is, I mean, the, the true, I mean, are, are real facts. Since that happened, that can be seen, can be measured, can be touched, and and uh, and I'm uh, 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 among those uh, who believe that uh, the the summit was not a complete a complete failure for the US, uh, but I believe that it was not a success. That's no one can say that the summit of the Americas was a success because all the blur that it created, especially when AMLO, and one have to recognize that to AMLO, as Sahili and Arnold said, uh, AMLO uh, took the step uh, forward and, and you know, uh, declared that he was not going to send uh, he was not going to participate as president in the summit and that he was going to send Evlar to the summit his foreign affairs minister and, and and everyone knows that Evlar is uh, is a 
he's a he's a center or center right guy uh so so no one sees uh, marcelo ebrard like a progressive guy but anyways i mean he i believe that he was doing his job as, as a diplomat while you know making his speech up there in los angeles and and many uh did the same including uh uh uh, Pedro Castillo from Peru, as, as Ahili mentioned it, and, and he went forward, <laughs> actually. Uh, one have to recognize that Pedro Castillo uh, what is the, uh, the, the former host of the, pre, of, of, the, of the previous summit of the Americas, and in that role, he was, uh, 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 his speech was in the opening of the summit, and of course, he had more pressure in that in that circumstance because everyone is watching at him. The president of the U.S. is there, but his speech was too much complacent to say the the, the least uh, about him and his condescendence with the U.S. Uh, you're, so, talk, you're, you're, talk, you're talking about the uh, president of Peru, Pedro, Pedro Castillo. Yes, that who's supposed to be left. I believe actually that he's a very leftist guy, but he is surrounded and, and you know, and, and pushed by the, the oligarchy in Peru to do stuff that maybe he's not, you know, he, he, he wouldn't like to do in regular circumstances. But anyway, going back now a little, a little bit south to, to Chile, uh, one have to recognize that, that the speeches, not only in the summit, but in public appearances, in meetings, you know, um, media, you know, engagements uh, of um, uh, Gabriel Boric from Chile uh, are the worst of the worst, uh, especially because he uh, is uh, constantly talking about the human rights in Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, while the south of Chile is burning in flames because uh, Mapuche people are fed up of the exploitation, expoliation of the, 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 the local oligarchy, but also transnationals that, that are, you know, taking their land away for centuries. Yeah. And he declared uh, a state of emergency a few weeks ago, and there are already several death Mapuche people out of that tense situation that they, ha they have there in the South. And he dares to talk about the human rights in Venezuela, Cuba, and, and, and Nicaragua. And, and I believe that that's a complete uh, hypocrisy. I mean, you have to be a big hypocrite uh, 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 to do that, yeah. at least if you are talking about Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuelan human rights, that might, we might have problems like any country in the world. I don't, I don't believe that the human rights issues in Venezuela, Cuba, or Nicaragua are bigger than the issues uh, of those issues in Colombia, Chile, Argentina, or any other place in the world. Uh, I actually believe that they are lesser in our countries, in those three countries. If you ask me exactly. exactly. Uh, so, but anyway, at least if he wants to talk about Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, he should have to uh, to to mention uh, the problems that he have in Chile, and that he promised that he will solve while he was candidate. So, anyway, that's part of the of the problems uh, with the, this left in in South America that is coming. But one have to deal with that. And now we have Petro, as you mentioned, in Colombia. And, and Petro seems to me uh, very uh, close to, 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 to Gabriel Boric. But I still have hopes in Petro, maybe thinking of his background as 19 uh, guerrilla movement in the 80s in Colombia. Uh, and he was pacified during a uh, peace process that happened in the 80s in Colombia. And, and he then became a professional politician. And he is a professional politician. And a lot of people in, in Colombia see him like uh, part of a status quo. Even most of the right wingers hate him. They see him like a, a, a status quo politician. And it's nice that he won, and especially because he has Francia Marquez. I, I have a lot of expectations with Francia Marquez 
uh, next to him and I hope that she managed to influence him in order to really push him towards the left. But one have to wait and see as we are seeing with Vorik. Well, you know, that being said, uh, Arnold, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 you know, Arnold, I'm, I'm, I'm curious your, uh, I'm curious your response to this. You know, just a quick follow up, uh, you know, on the issue of uh, Boric. Why do you think, you know, Boric is behaving uh, like this? Uh, you know, not just towards the indigenous people of Chile, but to, uh, you know, Cuba, Venezuela, and uh, and. Nicaragua is it because of his background like is there something about his background that he's just rubbed too much shoulders with the pseudo left in, in you know in the US and elsewhere that constantly uh, you know punch left towards Cuba and always have to marginalize Venezuela and Nicaragua because they read you know corrupt NGOs and whatnot or yeah so I'm, I'm curious I'm curious your response to why Boric is doing this when he should be you know, standing up against Canadian and American mining interests in his country. And, uh, you know, he, he does, he, you know, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious your response on, uh, you know, to that. First, I'd like to say that the electoral victory of Boric in Chile, in my view, was historical and very, very important. It was a major blow against Pinochet. That is the most important thing. And Boric, you know, it's not so much about Boric, but he was sort of rise, uh, riding that mass movement that has been developing in Chile over, you know, almost a decade now. And so it was good that he and his allies that included the Communist Party of Chile were able to use that situation to put open Pinochet policy in the background and open the way to a, uh, a more just society, a, uh, a, 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 Ch a Chile that is more uh, less uh, pro-US and all that. Now, one also has to say during the election campaign, he also made it very clear on several occasions, his critical attitude towards Venezuela, Nicaragua, and, and, and Cuba with regards to human rights and things like that. So, you know, that is not a, um, important thing as such, but it indicates the thinking of this guy. Why does he have an issue with Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, and not for the Mapuche in his own country? In fact, he is about to extend the special emergency le legislation initiated by his predecessor, predecessor against the Mapuche. You know, and he's completely, you know, he's pretty, pretty much like a social democrat. So, for example, when he went to Ottawa on his way from Chile to Los Angeles, he met with Trudeau. So Trudeau sell, felt very, very confident, and rightly so, in a manner of speaking, saying that Canada and Chile with Boric, here we are, we are the progressive wing of Latin America. Of course, if you say progressive in terms of social democracy, yeah, you're right, but it's also this progressive wing is also very much against revolution, definitely against communism. So when he came to power, you really have like a, a social democratic opposition to the Pinochet, but it still is good. And we will see what is going to happen from the base. For example, will the Map Mapuche agree with what he is doing, that uh, renegating on his promise to support that struggle? The same thing with regards to uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, um, and uh, Cuba, where amongst the people there, of course, oh, wow. there's a very strong sentiment in favor uh, of Cuba Why and, and Venezuela. Why the hell are you putting down these three countries, which are, na are, are our natural allies? So the main thing is that he is a social democrat. Let us see how much the Communist Party of Chile can do to put a halt to his ov more very overtly social democratic point of view and steer him on a path that is more distant from the United States is what the Chilean people want because do you think that the Chilean people forgot that Pinochet was put into a power into power by the a US coup d'etat with thousands of people being tortured 
in prison. Canada as well. Canada, Canada as well also supported. Yeah, the How can the Chilean people forget that? So why the hell are they trying to? Uh, will they accept someone who is feels free to sort of uh, uh, fraternalize in a friendly way with with the United States when they have committed so many crimes against the Chilean people? But this is something that we will see as the situation evolves in the next coming weeks and months. But I have faith in the Chilean people. There's a, a huge Chilean community in Montreal where from where I come from. And they're very much in favor for a revolutionary alternative to the uh, Pinochet type of uh, government that existed all these uh, years. Before I get to my next question, it's funny. Uh, Whitney uh, Webb, who, who, who I've interviewed on the program, who uncovered the uh, Epstein uh, uh, human trafficking uh, scandal sanctioned by organized crime and you know the US, British and Israeli deep state. Uh, she, I, you know, I, uh, she she said on her uh, Twitter when Gabriel Boric was elected, she said uh, because everybody you know was so happy with the victory because it was very much a rejection of uh, of uh, Pinochet and and, and right wingism. But Whitney Webb said, "Please stop praising Gabriel Boric like the second coming of Salvador Allende. He is the Chilean male AOC Michelle Bachelet with a beard." So I guess. I, 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 I guess Miss Webb was vindicated, but <laughs> but uh, moving on, my second, my Sahili second to final have question. a lot of stories about that. <laughs> no, not not stories exactly, but uh, uh, let's actually uh, let's see. Like I have, I have also followed. I tried to follow when Boris became the candidate, not the candidate, but before that, when he became the face of Frente Amplio of Chile. And that was from the time of mm, the social outburst in 2019. Okay, in 2019, October, when everything started happening. So at that, and after the time when he started to become the face of that movement, or etc. So uh, since that time, I tried to follow what he has, like, what he did before that. He was a well-known student leader in the 2011 student movement in Chile. So after that, I tried to see what he had to say about uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. And he has had this position forever. It's not like it just happened overnight. So he has had this position. Well, I don't know what his position was in 2011 or 2012, but in 2018, it was in 2018, in mid 2018, that uh, Chilean um, lawyer and legal expert, Margarita Labarca Godar, wrote uh, an article, an entire article, uh, uh, trying to tell Boric that he should look up laws and non-interference and stuff like that before he starts talking about human rights violations in other countries. He should also like look at the human rights violations that has happened in Chile, not just in time of Pinochet, which was a dictatorship and one can expect things like that. But even after that, in the democratic regimes of Lagos and Bachelet, both. So, and these, both these people said that they were from the left. And Pashalet, since we're talking about the Mapuche people and the state of emergency and stuff like that, Pashalet did the same thing. But during her second mandate, she also had um, these uh, states of emergency in uh, the Mapuche communities, like in the Mapuche territories, in Bio Bio, in uh, Arauca, et cetera. So, and people wow. had died then at that time too. Like there were workers, and uh, indigenous workers, people who were worked, like who were workers in their own lands and the multinationals were stealing their, just like Arnold was saying, mines as well as trees and lands. So they were like slaves in their own country. And these people yeah. had been gunned down by police when um, Bachelet was the president. So this happened during her second mandate. So like, it's not like these things are new and like, the Chilean left is a very soft left or more to the right than to the left. So Boric does not surprise me. He had all these declarations. Caviar left. <laughs> so Boric did not surprise me. He always like had these things. Like, even even an, wow. a grandson, a grandson of Salvador Allende, Pablo Sepulveda Allende, who is a doctor who has studied in Cuba and has worked in Venezuela and is now in Chile. He even he wrote and asking Boris to shut up about things that he does not understand. 
So <laughs> exactly. So this this was there. Like these words were there. Okay. So this. Well, that 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 explains everything. Then. That that All explains right. a lot. Not everything. So yes, it should. It is the task of the Chilean people to push him to the left. Exactly. And my second to final uh, question, my second to final question I wanted to ask about the summit of Americas. And, uh, and, and let's also, you know, let's tie in the, the Colombian presidential elections that saw a uh, left wing party and people power movement win. Uh, I want to ask uh, Arnold, I'm going to ask uh, you first and then Jesus can, uh, can, can, uh, can also respond to this, which is, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, was the uh, drug war addressed and the need to end it at the summit of Americas, or was you know l the left wing leadership and the delegates of uh, of the soft left uh, to the revolutionary left in Latin America were they uh, you know you know are they still unable to bravely and forcefully call an end to the drug war for? For whatever reason, so so and, and and I'm wondering when we talk about the recent Colombian presidential elections, did uh, Petro talk at all about the need to end the drug war, have a more of a compassionate approach to ending the drug war, or did they, or or was or is that a subject that 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 they simply did not want to touch because of uh, you know whatever their uh, reasons may be? Hey, Jesus, can you deal with the drug war, and I'll deal with the other things after. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I I believe that I mean the 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 the, the issue the 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 drug law discourse, even coming from the U.S. Uh, in recent years, has been going down the drain. If you ask me, you know what I mean. I mean, it, oh, wow. even not uh, the. I mean, no. I, I at least that's my impression. Well, it's, well, actually, well, actually, well, well, actually, uh, Jesus, in comp, in... Uh, yeah, actually, you know, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just want to, I, I, I just want to say that I completely agree with you because, because Black Lives Matter and all of the, you know, social justice movements uh, in the United States, they don't at all talk about ending the drug war, even though the new Jim Crow, the thing that yes. that, that that became the Bible of Black Lives Matter and 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 and, and a new revamped racial justice movement, clearly explicitly says we need to end the drug war. So so I'll, so yeah, I completely agree with you. But but continue on with what you were uh, saying. <laughs> yes, yes, and and and, and from. And from the social movement, uh, uh, you 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 can understand that posture. But even coming, I mean, I, I'm saying this, uh, taking into account what I can read coming from the White House of the Department of State. I mean, they has been talking less and less and less in recent years about the war on drugs, because that's something that they use uh, in the early 2000s to try to, you know, to, to, to in, the, in our case in Latin America, at least, to try to penetrate and, and have some excuses to uh, involve in internal affairs as they did in Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, and some Central American countries with the excuse of the war uh, on drugs that everyone knows that there's no war. I mean, the U.S. is the main, I mean, the U.S. government is the main cartel of drugs out there. Everyone knows exactly. that. And that's why President Chavez in, in his first years in government took the decision of expel the DAA from Venezuela. And they hate him from, for, from that. But that's what's on the, one of the best decisions that President Chavez took in his early years. And, and since then, the season, you know what I mean? I mean, Venezuela starts seizing more shipment of drugs when we spell the DEA from, the, from Venezuela. So, I mean, I'm, I just, you know, trying to frame your, your, your question within that reality and, and the numbers show, UN numbers, not uh, the Communist Party of Cuba or Venezuela or anywhere numbers. I mean, I'm talking about United Nations numbers shows that the drug business is growing and growing. How, I mean, I, I, I believe that some people realize that they cannot keep talking about the war on drugs because it's 
stupid to, to, to talk about that. So, 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 so but it's a reality and, and we have it there and we have it very closely because Colombia is our neighbor and we have very, you know, uh, deep relations with Colombia and we suffer firsthand the penetration of the US using the excuse on Colombia using the excuse of the war on drugs. And that's why we have seven military bases uh, of the US in Colombia, which are a direct threat to Venezuela and are, are used daily to monitor, to spy, to uh, provoke Venezuela in military terms. And, 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 and thankfully, uh, that you know narrative of the war on drugs is uh, banishing i don't know if you wow. want to add something compass <laughs> that's yeah that that's that, 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 that's a lot to chew on and uh, and it it is incredible it is incredible and i also think that's i i, I think unfortunately even amongst you know the you know the best of the left whether it's in latin america and in uh, north america still have these sort of conservative uh, blind spots when it comes to, you know, the issue of uh, drug uh, consumption. But uh, so, so that's something that we definitely have to ex uh, explore in the, I can, uh, I can add a, deeper in the future. And I can Arnold, add what's, one point. Yeah. I like Go to, ahead. One to, to um, amplify the very important uh, analysis that he, Jesus just gave us. Uh, Boris won the, ele I mean, um, the elections, were won in the evening two nights ago in uh, Colombia by yeah. the Petro Marquez picket. Columbia. Now the very same night of that victory, guess who gave a congratulatory message to the winning picket? None, none other than Blinky, the very same evening. Of course, he congr congratulated them. But I would like to, uh, with you, deconstruct two sentences that he made to the president-elect and his, and his vice president-elect addressing to them. And we, we go uh, evaluate what that means. He said, Blinky said, after congratulating, the U.S. and Colombia enjoy deep bonds between our peoples, shared values, and shared interests in democracy, security, inclusive economic prosperity, and human rights. Now, wait a second. Wake up. You know, the, the, the winning ticket won on a platform opposing all of that. Uh, he's trying to co-opt it and saying we are on the same page in order to solve these problems. And now it goes on the second sentence, cooperation between the United States and Colombia has improved public health, livelihood, rule of law, rule of law and, uh, and environmental protection, rule of law. How can he say, you know, can the United States is even, you know, he, the very evening of the elections, the United States is already pressuring uh, the Petro Marquez ticket to not deal with the issue of uh, the war on drugs, because they say that there's no issue there. Everything is fine. There's law and order in, in Colombia. Ask the thousands and thousands of people that have been killed by, uh, by the uh, Colombian government over the last couple of decades disappeared. That's the rule of law. So that statement is important. The United States, of course, had to recognize the election, but one should not have any illusions about the United States. The fact that it was, in my view, an earth-shaking event in Colombia and therefore in Latin America, it is for that same reason that one has to be very careful about how the United States is going to try to undo that victory. Of course, we cannot compare the, uh, the Petro uh, ticket to, for example, uh, um, Allende or something like that. It's not the same at all. Or at even more. Or even more. But at the same time, remember what happened when Allende won the elections. Coup d'etat against him. Now, even though the uh, market is not like that, and neither is Petro, uh, the United States is bound to do something to try to undo or neutralize that very historic victory. And we, all over the hemisphere, we have to be very uh, careful and show full support for the, uh, the new presidency uh, in their attempt to uh, apply as much as possible what they have promised to do during the elections. Yes, and uh, 
final question, my final question I wanted to ask uh, Saheli, I don't know if we, if, if we have time to get too deep into this. But, so briefly, if it's even possible, when I first spoke to uh, you Go and ahead. Jesus, <clears throat> Uh, I, uh, you know, and I reached out to you both. It was over, uh, you know, an article that, that 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 appeared in which WikiLeaks exposed how big money donors were funding Vox, the new far right uh, party in Spain. And uh, I've been reading, you know, Orinoco Tribune, and apparently Vox is trying to build a lot of solidarity and roots with big business and local far right reactionary movements in Latin America itself. Uh, would you like to uh, talk, uh, uh, you know, briefly, if it's possible, about this, and what are the implications of that in Spanish, uh, uh, ongoing Spanish neocolonialism in the region? Okay, so firstly, let's uh, have one thing very clear, that uh, in Latin America, what you may call far right is actually the right. I mean, the right is really exactly. far right. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, exactly. yes, the right is reactionary, the right is dictatorial. In fact, when right always accuses the left of being dictatorial, of authoritarian and everything, but it is they who do not recognize elections. When the left, even when they know that the election has been stolen from them, like it happened in case of, in case of Nicaragua in, I think, 2000, 2001, I think. So when that happened and the election was stolen from Daniel Ortega, who could have won, he finally won in 2006. But anyway, his earlier bid, which he lost, even in the, I mean, the OAS supported mission, observation mission had asked him that how can he accept the election? Because it was currently stolen, even the OAS supported mission was saying this, and yet he accepted, he said that that is the will of the people, it was not it was stolen, but it is still the will of the people. Or um, like in case of Honduras also, the last time, this time people like voted massively to um, support and to, so that the Xiomara Castro won. One. But other times, like in the earlier two times, the election were actually stolen. Like Juan Orlando Hernandez was never the real president of Honduras. He just stole the election both times. And of course, he should not have re-elected himself. There is no re-election law even in Honduras. You have only one term and then you go. But like the right-wing president had broken all laws and constitutionality to become um, president. So what I'm saying is that it is a right-wing in Latin America that's the far right. Okay, so there is no far right and uh, center right and stuff like that. It's all far right. Anyway, so <laughs> what works, like when I said the last time when we talked about this, it was just when WikiLeaks had published this thing, or leaked this thing. So what Vox is now doing is that I told you that at that time when we talked, there was Vox was having a program in Europe with countries where there are right wing governments far right governments, like in Hungary, like in Poland. So they were, Vox was having a program where they were inviting right wing people, right wing young people, young, smart, educated, etc., uh, tech savvy. So they were inviting these people into Europe, into these countries, letting them go into the parliaments, et cetera, and get educated, get indoctrinated, let's say. So it was an indoctrination program. And now they have sent these people back to, the, to their own countries. Now, I recently read in La Jornada, which is a Mexican left-wing newspaper, <laughs> that that woman whom I mentioned, Alicia Galvan, who, was, who had well, gone from Mexico to this program. So this woman has started a new foundation, okay? So I think, I, I don't that's, remember. That, that's, that, that's supporting a network of, uh, of Vox to build solidarity and bridges she said, with the right wing. She said that, that uh, Vox is not related to this, that PAN, La Partido Acción Nacional, which is the right wing party of Mexico. So is that, uh, she was from PAN also. She said that you no, know, no party is related to this. We are trying to save the country from communism, and they meant Morena and Albert, sorry, Andres Manuel and all those people. Anyway, so 
she said this, but she had been supported by people from Pan. She had been congratulated from pe by people from Vox. So this is one of the manifestations, the latest manifestation of this Vox thing in Latin America. There has been similar things in Peru. There was a, I told you that there was this woman from Peru also that went into this program and she has, she has started um, being an advisor to um, like Keiko Fujimori's party, okay? Yeah. So she had, and then there was a Chilean woman who was also in this program, and she she was in case of in Sebastian Piñera's government, she was in the education ministry. She worked on a program of like child dropouts and stuff like that. So she is still remaining with Piñera's party, and probably I don't know. I I haven't heard of her founding any foundation, but Alicia Galvan recently founded a foundation. Okay, so let's see what they are coming up with. In case of Mexico, there is already, there was also this talk of PAN saying that they would never support any, um, any constitutional reform that the president sends to the Senate or the Congress. Well, first you'll have to send it, send it to the Congress and then to the Senate. So said that they would not support or not vote on it or will vote against it, et cetera. And AMLO's party does not have a qualified majority that is a two third majority in either of the chambers. So in order to do constitutional reforms that qualified majority is necessary. So without some people from those parties voting with their heads, he would not be able to pass a law as well. There might, must be other ways there are decrees and stuff like that. He never does it. That's an interesting thing. He said that he would not, he could have sent in decrees or he could have done presidential decrees, but he wouldn't. And this again, shows that left is not authoritarian, it's the right. I'm not saying that decreeing is authoritarian, of course not, there are situations when you have to do it. But mm, left tries to exhaust all other potential ways before going into the extreme, whereas the right starts with the extreme. So this is something that Vox is trying to uh, do in uh, Latin America, but I'm not, I won't call it Spanish neocolonialism, although Spain was a special invitee in the summit of the Americas, the US invited Spain, but it's more like Spain is actually like a junior partner or a smaller brother, like younger brother of the US in the region. It has been for all this time, like for all these last 200 years since Spain was kicked out and but the US then came in. So Spain has remained a junior partner and it's still Listen. like that. Listen. Yeah. But that's all. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, Sahe, yes, I, I yes, now that you were talking, I was I was just remembering it, and we have talked about this box trend over Latin America with yes, Uri yes. before, as he said. And as you said, yes, I'm just uh, uh, realizing the importance of the connection between these far right movements, parties in Spain with the Catholic hierarchy. I mean, yeah. and, and that's something that we haven't disconnected yet too much um, before, because we were talking about the parties, we were like focusing in the parties, but the reality is that these parties uh, are built, these far right parties are built on the structure that was already created decades ago, if I'm yeah. maybe centuries ago, by the Spanish Catholic short hierarchy and, you know, uh, it's satellites all over Latin America. And, and we have uh, examples of that also in Venezuela. I mean, uh, President Chavez fight a lot with the, with the Catholic hierarchy and the Opus Dei movement, for example, which is all over the world. Yeah. And it's like the... The fascists. The seat for those right-wing parties. Uh, not only exactly, abs ab absolutely, absolutely. So, so I just wanted to highlight that connection between the, the Catholic Church and and those far-right parties like Vox because it's something that is absolutely connected. Yeah, well, I think that's a perf I think that's a perfect place to uh, end. And I think the lesson that we that, that we can draw from this is. Is uh, is yeah the the you know the 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 summit of the Americas was a bit of a mixed bag, but anything that's good that comes from it means that it is up to 
the people power movements, whether it's in Mexico or the entire region of Latin America, and us, the solidarity folk that exist in India, Canada, yours truly, Belgium, because the European Union and NATO, that's the belly of the beast, Belgium, <laughs> that, that, that we really do have to, you know, step up our uh, efforts and push back against these, uh, these endless uh, reactionary imperialist policies. Arnold, uh, before we uh, end, uh, any final thoughts that you want, uh, that you want to uh, share with us? Uh, you're, oh, muted. Uh, you're muted. Three very short final thoughts. One is, if anyone says, well, you know, how, you know, people like myself in Canada or others in the United States, what right do you have to call on countries in Latin America, for example, to boycott the uh, summit of the Americas? My answer to that is, it's our obligation because we living here in the belly of the beast or right next to the belly of the beast and who's been studying the situation there for decades, we have no illusions about US imperialism whether it's the Republican and Democrats. So it's up to us. We are obliged to share our feelings uh, with our friends to the South. Secondly, uh, to just develop one more point on why, as it sort of seems to be the consensus that the Summit of the Americas was not a major victory for the United States, nor a major flop as well. Uh, like when it, one more example, what happened after the summit as a way to evaluate, for example, if the United States, if it were those who were saying it was a great, it was a flop for the United States, but was the United States so intimidated after the summit? Does not seem so, because right after the summit, the United States hit Nicaragua with two more sets of sanctions, wow. hit Venezuela with more sanctions, and even hit Cuba with more sanctions after the summit. So I don't think they were intimidated very much. The my last point is, we're talking about positive things, is I really have to, uh, from this platform, extend my congratulations to three journalists from the United States who did what we all would wanted to do if we were there. I'm talking about Walter Smolarek, who face-to-face -face called out Amargo for his crimes against the people in Bolivia, face to yeah. face, they had to they had to drag him out of there, right? Yeah, he still finished it. And Abby Martin on the issue of journalists and Eugene Poirier, all three of them. That was the real resistance against the United States that reflected what we feel in Canada and even I would say all over Latin America. So my hats off to them. Thank you very much. All righty. Well, we were joined on this edition of uh, One Plus That's One, good. as well as uh, this special crossover episode with Saheli Chowdhury, uh, who's part of the editorial team at Orinoco Tribune, Jesus Rodriguez Espinoza, who is the editor in chief and founder of Orinoco Tribune, and one of my favorite people's, Arnold August, <laughs> who's. Uh, <laughs> I don't like the word expert, but he is an expert on uh, on uh, on uh, Cuba, journalist, historian, and uh, activist, uh, and one of the leading uh, Cuban solidarity uh, voices in uh, Canada. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And oh, uh, just before we also uh, end, uh, Arnold is going to be participating in a uh, debate this uh, September with uh, David Swanson of uh, World Beyond uh, War. And we're going to be, and I'm going to be moderating it, and it's going to be a very interesting, uh, and I can, and I can guarantee, very civil debate on our wars ever justifiable. And uh, and David, uh, if anyone has seen my interviews uh, with him, and if, and is, and anyone has ever seen David on the subject, he thinks that no wars are ever justifiable, even if it, even if they are, you know, wars against you know uh, imperialism and so forth. So it's going to be a very interesting. Uh, debate and uh, I wanted Arnold to be uh, to 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 sort of push back against that. So so check that out at worldbeyondwar.org. It's going to be in September, but be sure to reserve your places on uh, Zoom. So <laughs> so thank you all for joining uh, for, for 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 joining us. Thank well, you to the audience so. for for seeing. And remember, power to the people, debt to settler colonialism in North America and imperialism overseas. <laughs> right and free Julian Assange. Thanks a lot, Yuri. Welcome. And Orinoco. Praise be. Oh. <laughs>